At last, the writer and his reader can breathe a sigh of relief. At last, they can find some compensation for the disgust, the horror, or the sadness inspired by modern history, and above all by the colonization of the New World by Europeans. Up until this point, the only way these barbarians knew of taking possession of it was to begin by destroying its peoples, the only way of cultivating it to begin by laying it waste. At last, we can witness the seeds of reason, happiness, and humanity sown among the ruins and devastation of a continent still reeking with the blood of all its peoples, civilized or savage. Those are the words of the 18th century French writer Guillaume Reynal in his History of European Exploration and Colonization. He was speaking here of the Quakers of Pennsylvania. Obviously, Reynal was no big fan of the history of colonization so far, so what made the Quakers different? Did they really sow the seeds of reason, happiness, and humanity in America? I'm sure that's putting it too strongly, but I will say this about the Quakers. More than anyone else who colonized America, they at least tried to be decent. How did it turn out? Well, you'll just have to listen. Hello, and welcome to Early and Often, the history of elections in America. Episode 20, The Founding of Pennsylvania and Delaware II. Last time, we saw the beginnings of Quaker migration to the Delaware Valley, which if you'll remember is just north of the Chesapeake, modern-day New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware itself. Although the Dutch had claimed the region, the first real European colonists there were the Swedes, who set up the short-lived colony of New Sweden. New Sweden was conquered by the Dutch, who were then in turn conquered by the English. The region then became part of the colony of New York. Well, at least the eastern half did. The patent the king gave to his brother James for control of the region only extended to the eastern shore. The western shore, which was right next to Maryland, was in an ambiguous position. It was claimed by both New York and Maryland. Anyway, as we heard last week, James decided to split New York up, and he gave two of his friends a bunch of land in the southern half, which became the colony of New Jersey. After a bit of time, New Jersey was itself subdivided into two separate colonies, East Jersey and West Jersey. West Jersey was on the eastern shore of the Delaware Bay. The region as a whole was still sparsely populated, and most of the Europeans there were non-English. That only began to change with the arrival of the Quakers to West Jersey in 1677. Got it? Good. We'll start this episode by introducing one of the most important Quakers and one of the most important figures in American colonization, William Penn. Penn was born in 1644 to a wealthy and influential family, his father was an admiral who fought for Parliament during the Civil War and for Cromwell during the Protectorate. But his father switched sides during the Restoration and stayed in favor. In fact, young William Penn became a good friend of Charles II. He was very religious from a young age, and he had what David Hackett Fisher called, quote, mystic visions. Penn's father had considerable estates in Ireland, and it was while working at those estates that Penn first encountered Quaker missionaries. He was drawn to the earnestness of Quakerism, since he found Anglicanism to be full of, quote, empty shows and formalities that masqueraded as the religion of Christ. In fact, he got kicked out of Oxford for refusing to conform to Anglican practices. He officially became a Quaker in the 1660s. This was after the Quakers began moving on from their early period of unruliness, which suited Penn just fine. He was no radical. He was a true believer, but he was also a practical man. Penn was easily one of the most prominent Quakers, by virtue of his high position. But he didn't just sit on his hands, giving out money. No, he went around preaching as a missionary in Europe, he wrote books on Quakerism and in defense of religious liberty, and he was even imprisoned four times for his heresies, maintaining his friendship with the royal family all the while. On top of that, he was a trained lawyer. And he also knew the philosophers John Locke and Sidney Algernon. In fact, Locke even owned several books written by Penn, and he provided comments on Penn's constitution for Pennsylvania. And Penn, for his part, helped get Locke a royal pardon while he was living in exile in the Netherlands. And like Locke, Penn was a big believer in toleration. So you can see why Penn was in such a good position to do something for the Quakers, something to help them escape their persecution. It's really hard to imagine anyone better suited, other than maybe if a member of the royal family had somehow become a Quaker. Anyway, over time he became more and more interested in America, and as we heard last episode, he became one of the proprietors of West Jersey. Not only that, he either wrote or at least oversaw the writing of the first constitution for that colony. In 
but it seemed to Penn that West Jersey wasn't enough. It was too small, there wasn't enough room for expansion. Plus, all of New Jersey was hopelessly tied up in legal confusion. And persecution of Quakers was picking back up again in the late 1670s. Penn needed more. So, he petitioned King Charles to give him the charter for a new colony. He reminded Charles that the crown owed his family a substantial amount of money, and that this colony would be a good way to pay off some of those debts at little cost. And Charles would be happy to see a bunch of Quakers leave England, since that would take them off his hands. And so, in 1681, the king agreed, against the wishes of his advisors, and gave to Penn a charter for the area just inland from the Delaware Bay, more or less. The exact borders were ambiguous. This became the colony of Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, although the colony was actually named after his father rather than William Penn himself. Unlike West Jersey, Pennsylvania was to be a proprietorship run by one man alone, William Penn. However, Penn was given less power than his counterparts in, say, Maryland or New York. There were some clauses in the Charter designed to increase the power of the king. The Charter specifically mandated obedience to the Navigation Acts, and gave the king the right to appoint his own customs officials to the colony to make sure that the acts were enforced. Also, the king's right to overturn court cases and to veto legislation passed within the colony was re-emphasized. Now, the land that Penn received didn't actually go all the way to the ocean. It began instead right at the top of Delaware Bay. This was a problem for Penn, who wanted to ensure that he had access to the sea. So, in addition to the grant for Pennsylvania, he also secured a charter for the west bank of Delaware Bay, which, as I said, was also claimed by Maryland. It wasn't very big, only 2,000 square miles. There were maybe a thousand settlers already in this additional region, a mix of Dutch, Swedes, English, and so on. They weren't generally Quakers, and they resented being ruled by Quakers. Although this land was adjacent to Pennsylvania, in terms of climate it more closely resembled the Chesapeake. In the beginning, this territory was lumped in with the rest of Pennsylvania, and the whole area was governed as a single unit. But because of its separateness, both geographically and culturally, within two decades it was separated from the rest of Pennsylvania. It was still controlled by the Penn family, but it was essentially separate. Over time, this became the colony and then the state of Delaware. But for now, it's just an appendage of much larger Pennsylvania. Now that he had both of these charters, Penn then drafted a constitution for his new colony, the so-called Frame of Government of Pennsylvania. We have some of the earlier drafts of this constitution, so we can trace its development. In the first draft, Penn proposed that the legislature would have a hereditary upper house, but this was thought too pretentious. Then he went the other way and gave the lower house almost all the power, but the financial backers of the colony thought that this was too liberal. In the final version, Penn worked out a compromised position. The frame opens with an extremely Quakerish preamble. Quote, when the great and wise God had made the world, of all his creatures it pleased him to choose man his deputy to rule it, and to fit him for so great a charge and trust, he did not only qualify him with skill and power, but with integrity to use them justly. This native goodness was equally his honor and his happiness, and whilst he stood there, all went well. There was no need of coercive or compulsive means. The precept of divine love and truth, in his bosom, was the guide and keeper of his innocency. But lust prevailing against duty made a lamentable breach upon it, and the law, that before had no power over him, took place upon him, and his disobedient posterity, that such as would not live conformable to the holy law within, should fall under the reproof and correction of the just law without, in a judicial administration. End quote. Basically, government was needed because not everyone listened to their inner light. So, what sort of government did William Penn devise to match his ideals? Well, it wasn't all that dissimilar to the other colonial governments, but there were some differences worth noting. There was to be a governor, of course, either William Penn himself or a deputy he appointed if he left the colony. The governor was actually a very weak figure. His only real power was to oversee the upper legislative house, the provincial council. He couldn't even veto legislation or anything. This provincial council wasn't like the other executive councils we've heard about. It was more like the magistrates in New England. Instead of a small group of appointed men advising the governor, the provincial council was to be a much larger body of 72 elected men, who would each serve terms of three years, with a third of the seats up for election in any given year. Members of the council couldn't run for re-election for at least a year until after their previous term ended. The council would have the sole right to initiate legislation. Pretty similar to the modern Senate, which is also a large body where a third of the members are up for election each cycle. Below the council, there was to be a general assembly of 200 representatives, all of whom were to be elected annually. 
but this body had fairly limited powers. They could propose amendments to legislation passed by the council, and they could veto bills, but that was about it. They couldn't do anything on their own initiative. As for other officials, they were to be chosen through a process of double nomination, like we saw in New Netherland. For instance, the council was supposed to name two candidates for a given judgeship, and the governor would pick the winner from the names supplied, while the assembly was given the right to nominate local officials, such as sheriff or justice of the peace. Elections were to be by ballot instead of by voice, which was apparently becoming the standard way of doing things in the newer colonies. There were property requirements for voting and running for office. You had to be a Christian man over the age of 21, who either owned 100 acres of land, 50 acres if you were an ex-servant, or paid a personal tax. This was quite lenient, and perhaps half of all men were eligible to vote. Basic legal rights were guaranteed. The death penalty was restricted to cases of murder and treason, which was a big change compared to the laws of England, which could be quite harsh. Freedom of religion was guaranteed for all those who believed in God. That didn't mean that the government was above enforcing morality. For instance, the law stated that, quote, all prizes, stage plays, cards, dice, may games, gamesters, masks, revels, bull baitings, cockfightings, bear baitings, and the like, which excite the people to rudeness, cruelty, looseness, and irreligion, shall be respectively discouraged and severely punished. The Constitution could be modified with the approval of the governor and six sevenths of both the council and assembly, a very high bar to clear. It's interesting to compare this Constitution, and John Locke's Constitution for Carolina, with the earlier pre-Restoration colonial constitutions. There's a big difference. The later constitutions are based much more in theory than in tradition. Or at any rate, the authors tried to base them in theory. In practice, they always had to make compromises with reality. Pennsylvania was no exception. Many Quakers were disappointed that Penn hadn't gone further in securing their liberties or in weakening the authority of the proprietor. And the philosopher Algernon Sidney called the frame of government, quote, the basest laws in the world which, to be fair, was an exaggeration, more about Sidney's disappointed expectations than about the frame of government itself. On the other hand, in a later generation, Voltaire praised Penn to the heavens, saying that he, quote, might well have boasted that he brought back the Golden Age, of which so much is spoken and which in fact never really existed save in Pennsylvania. As we'll see, that's also an exaggeration. The actual truth lay somewhere in between those two extremes. Penn was never going to create a utopia, and as the proprietor, he was never going to completely eliminate the proprietor's authority. To think otherwise was foolish. So he was necessarily going to fall short of whatever ideals people had in mind. Nevertheless, it's clear, I think, that expectations for government were beginning to change. Tradition was no longer an adequate justification, at least in the minds of some. Reason was needed as well. While the frame of government was being written and the legalities sorted out, Penn sent over an advance inspection team to scope out the land and figure out where to build a capital city. The spot they chose was a ways up the Delaware River, since too much of the land by the coast had already been claimed. This site would become Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, a very Quakerish flourish. In 1682, Penn and the first batch of colonists set sail. Almost a third of the hundred passengers died from smallpox on the way over. Penn, who had survived smallpox as a child, was thankfully immune, and he did what he could to tend to the sick. Soon after their arrival, Penn summoned delegates from Pennsylvania and Delaware so that they could approve his frame of government, as well as some associated laws. However, the delegates rejected a good number of provisions, especially objecting to the fact that the Assembly had no power to initiate legislation. And so, Penn's constitution was only partly enacted. Nevertheless, that next year the Council and the Assembly met for the first time. An act was passed which guaranteed equality between the settlers, regardless of their national origins. Beyond that, there were still plenty of disagreements over the frame of government, and Penn wound up drafting a new document. The council and assembly were both hugely shrunk, reduced to 18 and 36 members, respectively. And the assembly was given a greater say in legislation, although nothing close to what they wanted. But on the other hand, Penn gave himself the right to veto legislation, which he hadn't actually had in the previous constitution so it was hardly a total victory for the colonists. Mostly it just pushed Pennsylvania further into line with the other colonies. There would be a surprising amount of discord in Pennsylvania, whether over the frame of government or over land sales or over trade policy, but that didn't stop colonists from emigrating. Penn had also been writing pamphlets to advertise his new colony, and he was pretty successful, 
About 1,400 Quakers had settled in West Jersey in those first few years, but by 1685, 8,000 had gone to Pennsylvania. According to Fisher, quote, Altogether, as many as 23,000 colonists moved to the Delaware Valley during the 40 years from 1675 to 1715. So many came that Quakerism back in England took a demographic hit. Philadelphia soon became the largest urban area in colonial America, a position it would hold until it was finally surpassed by New York City in 1810. This was as big a migration as to New England, though over a longer period of time. Mortality rates were in between the very low levels in New England and the very high levels in the Chesapeake, but the mortality rate did increase over time, as diseases like malaria were introduced to the Delaware and became endemic. Like the Puritans, the Quakers often came in family groups, which meant that Pennsylvania became a settled society almost immediately, rather than a rough frontier region. The Quakers were of somewhat lower social standing than the Puritans had been. Unlike the Puritans who tried to exclude the poor from New England, the Quakers actually raised funds to send poor Quakers to America. And William Penn aside, there weren't that many high-class Quakers to begin with. According to Fisher, quote, most were husbandmen, craftsmen, laborers, and servants. So other than the servants, they were for the most part economically independent workers. Lower middle class, basically. Conditions for servants were better than in the Chesapeake, at least. Like in New York, contracts couldn't be freely bought and sold, which curbed at least some of the abuses. Quakers cared about basic education, but not so much about higher learning. They favored widespread literacy and understanding of the Bible, but anything beyond that was superfluous. And even wealthy Quakers were generally unable to attend universities in England because of their faith, so there wasn't a large contingent of college-educated ministers like with the Puritans. And honestly, the Quakers were also lax in setting up a basic education system. There was no broad network of public schools like in New England, although there were plenty of religious schools. Nor did the Quakers set up universities. And the results were obvious. In the mid-1700s, only half of adults in the region could even sign their own name, and the number was even lower for women. David Hackett Fisher argues that this lack of concern for literacy and education increased inequality among the Quakers over time, since it meant that the poor had fewer opportunities to better themselves, which weakened the cultural cohesion of the Quakers as a whole as time went on. Anyway, there was another difference between the Delaware Valley and most of the other English colonies. Unlike those other colonies, Pennsylvania was cosmopolitan. With the exception of New York, all the other English colonies in America were populated almost exclusively by Englishmen. That wasn't the case in the Delaware Valley. According to Fisher, by 1700, only two-thirds of these settlers in the region were English or Welsh. A majority, but not a very large majority. A tenth of the settlers in Philadelphia County were Irish, others were Welsh or European. Part of the reason was that the Quakers themselves were very diverse, and members from some other Protestant denominations settled in the region as well, often from Germany. Between 1683 and 1726, some 5,000 German speakers came to Pennsylvania, a large but not overwhelming number. But in the 30 years after that, some 57,000 Germans moved to the region. In fact, by the end, Pennsylvania wasn't even a majority English colony anymore. Some of these groups set up separate ethnic enclaves to live in, but most of them merged into the larger English culture over time, although a few unusual sects, like the Amish, retain their distinctive culture and language even to this day. In the beginning, there were sometimes tensions between the different ethnicities, but nothing overwhelming. There was an attempt by English Quakers to weaken the power of Welsh Quakers. The Welsh had settled in their own region, and the English deliberately drew the county boundaries of Pennsylvania to divide the Welsh settlement into two. That way, the Welsh formed a minority in two counties instead of a majority in one, which meant that they had less local authority and independence. Fisher calls this, quote, the earliest instance of gerrymandering in American history. Gerrymandering, if you're not familiar with the term, is when politicians manipulate the borders of voting districts in order to strengthen one group at the expense of another. That'll be an important feature of American politics in the future. But the more important impact of this diversity wasn't political, at least not immediately. It was cultural. Unlike in New England, where the Puritans made up a majority of the region for a very long time, the Quakers of the Delaware Valley were only ever one group among many. Quakers and Quaker sympathizers together made up a majority of the region towards the start, but they were gradually overwhelmed by other groups in terms of numbers. No, Pennsylvania would not wind up a Quaker paradise, but for the time being, they were still in charge. The Quakers were not as overtly theocratic as the Puritans. They didn't restrict voting to members of a particular religion. 
but in practice it was nevertheless the Quakers who got elected to important positions and who controlled the government. To the end of the colonial period, Quakers always made up a majority of the assembly, even when they'd become a small fraction of the population. And the Quakers used their power to put Quaker norms into practice. For instance, there was no military or militia. The Quakers were pacifistic and extremely optimistic about human nature. If you were good to people, they'd behave, with minimal need for force or coercion. This policy succeeded at first, thanks in part to the good luck that the Indians of the region, the Lenape, also known as the Delaware, were quite friendly. Thanks to the previous settlements in the region, they had experience with Europeans, and they were quite willing to cooperate with the colonists. And William Penn, for his part, was determined to deal with them as fairly as possible. He was aware of how poorly relations had gone everywhere else. He even went so far as to try to learn their language, which was quite unusual at the time. Both relations with the Indians and the Quaker policy of pacifism in general would break down in the decades to come, but for a while, it was pretty successful. Most of the settlers were, of course, farmers. Wheat was the most common crop rather than tobacco, so no big plantations. Penn's original hope for Pennsylvania was that the colonists would set up their homes in small rural clusters. Imagine ten or so houses within walking distance of each other, surrounded by a larger area of farmland villages rather than towns or remote plantations. However, the colonists themselves frustrated Penn's plans. They had no desire for anything so orderly. And Penn was never able to enforce strict land regulations since he needed to sell off as much land as possible to whoever would buy it in order to raise money, so people pretty much did as they pleased. As a result, colonists in Pennsylvania tended to live in spread out farms. Maybe not as spread out as in Virginia, but still pretty spread out. Not everyone was a farmer. With Philadelphia becoming a trading hub, many other professions were needed. Within a few years of settlement, one observer noted that, quote, They have also coopers, smiths, bricklayers, wheelwrights, plowrights and millwrights, ship carpenters and other trades, which work upon what the country produces for manufactories. There are iron houses and a furnace and forging mill already set up in East Jersey where they make iron. The Quakers were also early pioneers of finance. It was Quakers who set up the first bank in the English colonies, and they established insurance companies as well. In fact, for a while it was Philadelphia which was the financial center of the colonies rather than New York. Nevertheless, in the early decades, wealth and land distribution were extremely equal. In one Pennsylvania county, according to Fisher, quote, The richest 10% held only 23.8% of assessed taxable wealth in 1693, an unusually small share by comparison with other cultures. In the Chesapeake colonies, as we have seen, the richest 10% held more than two-thirds of the taxable wealth. Partly this was just due to Pennsylvania being a young colony, but it was also partly to do with Quaker culture. Quakers were much more concerned with alleviating poverty than the Puritans or anyone else. The Quakers actually did more than the grudging minimum. And in a break with tradition, Quaker inheritances generally went to all children equally, rather than just to the eldest son, which reduced the concentration of wealth as well. Despite these efforts, Pennsylvania did wind up with elite families who played a leading role in politics, although the elite families in Pennsylvania came from more humble backgrounds and were more open to newcomers than elsewhere. And in any case, the values of the Quakers were extremely different from those of the first families in Virginia. There were none of the aristocratic pretensions. The Quakers saw money and birth as poor substitutes for personal virtue. Not that that stopped money from mattering more over time. There's one last aspect of life in early Pennsylvania to discuss. Slavery. Quakers weren't averse to slavery in the beginning. Even William Penn owned slaves. Quakers in the southern colonies held slaves just like everyone else, and in Pennsylvania, slavery was not uncommon, even right at the start, although because Pennsylvania was slightly too far north for plantation slavery, the numbers remained small. In 1700, there were still only a few hundred blacks in the colony. And Quakers shared the racism of their fellow colonists. In the 1720s, a law was passed banning miscegenation, or sexual relations between races. Laws like that have become a recurring theme at this point. Quakers only began admitting black members in the 1780s, after independence, and even then black Quakers were segregated from everyone else. However, Quakers were also among the first to turn against slavery. Within the first decade of colonization in Pennsylvania, some Quakers began to speak against slavery, and gradually, anti-slavery sentiment spread. By the 1750s, Quakers as a whole turned against the institution, and many Quakers became important abolitionists. So that's what life was like in early Pennsylvania. The foundation was an egalitarian Quakerism, but with increasing diversity and inequality over time. 
and Quakerism itself would change. Throughout the 1700s, many Quakers withdrew from the inevitable compromises of public life to focus more on spiritual matters, and in the 1800s, Quakerism splintered into various sects and lost members to other, more dynamic religious denominations. Still, two presidents came from Quaker families, Herbert Hoover and Richard Nixon, while a number of others were descended from this Quaker migration. Anyway, back to the narrative. Although William Penn had intended to spend the rest of his life in Pennsylvania, a dispute with Maryland over control of Delaware required his return to England just two years after his arrival, and he wouldn't manage to get back to America until 1699. I won't bore you with the details of the dispute between Penn and the Calverts. All you really need to know is that in the end, Penn kept control of Delaware. But in the meantime, instead of appointing a deputy in his absence, Penn just let the council run the government. These were elected men, but in practice the council was controlled by Penn's allies. However, within a few years, the council was splitting into factions, some of which were opposed to some of Penn's policies, particularly his restrictions on the buying and selling of land. As a result, Penn took control of the government away from the council and gave it to a smaller body of just five men. However, even that proved insufficient, and Penn wound up having to select a single person to rule in his absence. But the man he chose was, for some reason, a Puritan ex-soldier who didn't even like Quakers. That guy faced such resistance from the rest of the government that he eventually resigned, and power returned to the council as a whole. The point is, Pennsylvania's government was still being worked out. In some respects, the proprietary model was a bad fit for Pennsylvania. The Quakers were by disposition egalitarian and didn't have much in the way of a hierarchy. Although William Penn was himself a Quaker, and although he was genuinely interested in founding some sort of Quaker utopia, the rights and privileges he had as proprietor would necessarily clash with everyone else. Having an elected governor like in New England probably would have worked out better, but that just wasn't how things played out. Well, that wraps up the very early story of the Delaware Valley. There will be a lot more to say about Pennsylvania in the future, but we won't be getting back to it for a little while. If you've been paying attention, you'll notice that we've now introduced almost all of the original 13 colonies. Only Georgia is missing, and that won't be founded for a while. Now that we've taken the stories of all these colonies up through the 1680s or so, it's time to look at an event that would have ramifications up and down America, the Glorious Revolution. So join me next time on Early and Often, the history of elections in America. If you like the podcast, please write it on iTunes. You can also keep track of Early and Often on Twitter at Early Often Pod, or read transcripts of every episode of the blog at earlyandoftenpodcast.wordpress.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you.